Today, we're going to build a coding agent. And more than that, we're going to build one with access to the latest tools that is similar to what you might see in a Claude code or in a cursor. And the amazing thing here is that we're going to do it in 200 lines of Python uh, with just one external dependency, Anthropic. And my goal is to show you that this can be pretty simple. And if you get down to it and learn the concepts, you can understand how all of these tools that you use every day work. And it's really cool. So we have our simple agent here, and we're going to say, help me fix my broken file. I didn't even specify what file I want fixed, but that's okay because our agent's going to list our directory here and it's going to see there's a file called broken file, which is probably the right one. Um, so uh, we got some crazy stuff going on here. Um, I'm a little rusty with my Python <laughs> on this return statement. Um, but our agent sees the issues in the file, reasons through them, and then executes our string replace tool uh, to fix those problematic areas. I think the coolest thing this still makes me kind of amazed every time I see it. It runs the file, gets the output, now it knows that it works. Um, so just like that, our agent's working in a loop. That's a simple one. Let's try out something a little bit more complex. Uh, research, ah, the new copy dot replace functionality in Python 313 and write a short example file. So now we're asking for something a little bit more complex. Hey, can you go out and learn about this thing that you might not know about already um, and then create a file uh, that demonstrates how that works? So let's see what we got here because we just got a lot of output. So um, I'll research our new copy replace functionality, looked up Python 313 copy replace examples. Um, then it created our file. Then it actually checked our Python version which is pretty cool, um, verified we have 3.13, and then it ran our new example. And so we get a little uh, tour of uh, some named tuples, <laughs> some data class stuff. Okay, so this is like very uh, thorough. I love it. Um, and we understand how these things changed. So agents are able to go do research, do all those same operations. So that's what we built. Let's break down exactly how it works. This uh, deck that I'm gonna walk through is a version of a hosted notebook. You can find the link for that in the description as well as a link to all of the code uh, that I wrote for this demo. And so at the core, our agent really isn't that complicated. And it's just a simple tree of some logic here. Um, we're gonna accept user input and send it to Claude. Now, if Claude needs tools, we're gonna execute those tools and we kind of provide the tool definitions. That's important. We're going to talk about that. Um, once we execute those tools, we're going to send the results to Claude and the loop kind of continues. Now, at some point, Claude doesn't need tools, and that's when we're going to show our response. So we're kind of using that as uh, a break to get out of the, the loop there. Now, jumping in, we need to give our agent access to tools so that it can do stuff, right? How do we normally do that? Normally, we'd use a JSON schema. And this is an example, right? So if you defined your own web search tool, um, you might def web search, and then you're gonna have to provide this like lengthy schema definition for Claude or OpenAI or any other model really to understand. Now, that doesn't sound fun. We don't really want to do that. And Claude comes with some predefined tools that don't need lengthy definitions like that. So here you can see this is gonna be the initialization statement. If you open up that Python file, um, we're defining our model, uh, our API key and three tools. So we have text editor, web search, and bash. Note, these, this is three line definition. We don't need the schema def because uh, right, we have Claude uh, to kind of rely on for these tools. Now, let's talk about prompting. So I said this was 200 lines. I lied, the prompt is 200 lines. JK, the, the prompt is imported from another file. So if you count the prompt, it's longer. Um, and typically, I think shorter prompts work well. Uh, but for this uh, example, I really wanted to explain um, all the different prompting techniques you can use to get the most out of the agent. And this works really well. We'll also talk about why this isn't expensive. So this is our prompt on the right, starting with role. This is important. So we're going to define the agent's role expert software engineering assistant, um, as well as the scope of what it's doing. Hey, you're working in the current directory. Um, and this is a best practice, um, as well as using these XML tags. Now, you don't have to use XML tags, but I've found that in my own prompts, it actually just makes it easier to read, right? When we have this nice linting, I can kind of go through here and skim the prompt and understand what the different sections are. Maybe that's why it works well for LLMs too. Maybe there's something about uh, sort of their statistical interpretation of these files. I don't know. But what I do know is that XML makes things uh, easier to read. Next, 
as I mentioned, we get into context and role using the role tag. There's some um, things that we'll do there later on in our system prompts that we'll talk about as well. We use this thinking process block to evoke a chain of thought prompting on our agent. So basically by telling Claude to think, it thinks. It's pretty crazy. Um, <laughs> you're like the ultimate manager. You're like, think harder. And it's like, yes. Um, so we're going to encourage our model to think. And then we're going to pro provide explicit declarative instructions on exactly what to do. Hey, understand first, make targeted changes, create files, test them, handle errors. This could be maybe a little a little verbose, but uh, I think uh, the important part here is specifying UV run, just because that's the manager used for this demo rather, um, as well as error handling and some other things. I think the explicit task definition is another best practice that's quite important. Finally, we're gonna give some tool use best practices. Use parallel tool calls when performing multiple independent operations. Always check if files exist. These are not required, they're optional, but they're also a best practice. Parallel tool use works by default, but you can get better results if you specify, hey, do this all the time. Finally, some code quality principles. So that's that's our prompt in a nutshell. Um, you might be asking, Matt, how did you come up with this? Uh, largely, it was by looking up best practices, thinking about best practices, and then prompting Claude to help me create this prompt. Um, so next, we defined our prompt. We ran our kind of input statement. Now we actually need to execute all those tools that we defined. So the one big function that we're going to have in our program here is our execute tool function. Don't, this doesn't look, you know, this looks kind of like long and a little hairy, but it's really just an if else statement wrapped in a try except block. So there's a try block. Um, and then this is like if, so if tool name equals view, if to else, if tool name equals create, um, the sub sort of sub tool names for string replace editor are view, create, string replace. So the first three things we're doing here is basically handling when our agent says, I need to do this operation on a file. And if it says it needs to view the file, well, we're going to say, is the file actually a file? If so, we're going to read it. We're going to say, OK, well, if it's not a file, is it a directory? And if it is, we're going to basically list the directory so forth right so we could walk through this but really same thing here string replace tool uh we're just content replace now what's important about this is that every sort of return case here has the same structure and that is content and is error and so we're passing both of those back to the model so that the model understands what was run and if it was an error and by explicitly telling the model if there was an error it can actually handle a lot of the retry stuff on its own and that's pretty cool so if you run this demo and it does something kind of silly you'll notice that it'll say okay i noticed that i got the feedback and then it'll try again and that's because of that tool use loop that we implemented right um so we have our string replace tool we have our bash tool which is executing commands all this is really doing is running sub process uh with a 30 second timeout that's a best practice as well Probably could have put some guardrails on this one. Um, so our agent's not running any crazy bash commands. <laughs> so don't ask it to do anything silly. Um, yes. <laughs> and then we're just returning the standard out and standard error from the uh, from our um, from our bash tool. And so really, again, very simple uh, at the core here, um, but maybe unintuitive if you're new to these concepts. Um, so we have our initialization. We have our prompt. We have um, our tool handling let's break down the core agent loop here and and this is this is 113 lines so we're, we're going to walk through it um so we're going to load our prompt this is another best practice typically role definition goes in the system prompt everything else goes in the first user message so our system prompt is going to be our role definition our user first prompt which you can see here is going in um, our first message is going to be everything else, which brings us to kind of our first best practice in the Anthropic API here, um, which is caching. So caching, I feel like caching is usually complicated. It's really uh, straightforward when you break it down. Um, what caching does is it gets us like a 90% discount or something on the tokens that we cache. So if we're sending the same instructions to our agent all the time, uh, Claude can actually cache those instructions up to a certain point. And um, you know, basically give us cost savings because it doesn't have to process different instructions every time. It's kind of like, I don't know, if you're going into a sandwich shop and you're ordering the same sandwich, you go in there, they already know what sandwich you're going to order. 
they don't even have to ask you for your order. Pretty great. Now, <laughs> important to message, this, that was a terrible analogy. It's important to mention um, our, our cache actually operates on everything, like, it, like in a list, basically. It operates on everything that comes before it. So what we're saying here is on the first user message, cache control type ephemeral, that's going to cache everything that came before and up to that first user message. So the order it works is tools, system prompt, messages, which means that caching here actually caches our tools, our system prompt, and this first message, which is pretty great. Now, the very next message is going to be our user input. So that's what we type in. Um, so we have two while loops. And basically what we want to do is run the second while loop uh, and then break when Claude doesn't need a response. And the way that we do that is through stop reasons. So we talked about, hey, while Claude is returning tools, we want to do stuff when it's not, we don't. How do we do that? Well, we look for our response.stop reason. This is another best practice um, is to check stop reasons, like check all of the stop reasons. I don't do this that in this demo. That's another good area for exploration. But we know that um, if uh, we are not using a tool, we don't want to do this. So that's what we're doing here. Another thing to call out, temperature. I set the temperature lower for this model just so that we get maybe shorter, uh, more predictable responses. Um, that's mainly an output control thing that I was doing here. And then max tokens, this was relatively arbitrary. I think that would require a bit more further understanding um, to understand like how we change the max tokens for our client messages. Um, so yeah, there's probably more work to be done there. But what are we doing on each message? Well, we're basically collecting tool calls. So this is another if else block where we're just looking at, did the model return text? Did the model have a server tool use, which would correspond to our web search? So web search is unique. You might've noticed it wasn't in our tool definition block. That's because it's executed on the server. So we don't actually have to implement web search ourselves. Anthropic takes care of that for us. So slightly different case here. We're just gonna um, print uh, some you know, statements here. Um, but for our uh, citations that come with that web search, we'll also return those. Um, the other block here is looking for our bash tools uh, and our stream replace tool. So based on this um, output for each block that has response content, so for every tool that's executed, because as I mentioned, Claude can execute multiple tools in parallel, we're going to append those to our tool calls dictionary or list rather. So once we have a list of tool calls, we're going to loop through that list. We're going to assign some variables and then we're going to basically handle the results and execute the tools. So basically, Claude, we send a message. We say, Claude, I want to do this thing. Claude comes back and says, this is step one to doing this thing. I need to call you know, my view tool. I need to call my web search tool, blah, all of the stuff. Then we get that message back and we say, OK, now we're going to actually execute the tools. So if tools were requested, we're making conditional calls to our executor function by extracting relevant details. Um, so we talked about how web search handling differs. And you can see here what we're doing is we're taking our uh, tool results. We execute the tools. We take our tool results. Um, and um, we are uh, passing these back to Claude. So we have a list of our executions. We're going through each tool call. We're collecting, we're executing it. And then we're collecting the result, which is the content here. Um, uh, we're collecting our error. Um, and then we're appending that back on to our agent. So basically looping through, assigning those blocks to our tool results and tool calls, and then um, appending those results and calls to our messages. And that's pretty much it. Like that's, that's the whole agent, right? The bottom down here, we're uh, handling non-tool responses, so maybe the last response in a message. And then if response.stop reason in end turn, break, break out of the inner loop to restart the conversation that takes us right back up to our user input. So, you know, like uh, I would love to say this is really complicated and you shouldn't try to build agents, but it's really not, right? And hopefully by breaking this down, you can see that it's very logical. Um, it's very measured. Uh, and at the end of the day, to build a simple agent that does some really amazing things, you just need a while loop, a couple while loops, some try blocks, some you know error for some error raises. Uh, yeah, you know it's it's it can be very approachable, especially with just one library.
what are some next steps here? Because we talked about a lot. Well, I think that there could be some more robust stop reason handling, retry logic, try accept blocks. Um, our agent's going to retry tools because of the, the loop that we built, but there are all sorts of weird error cases, as I'm sure you'll see. It's actually not as simple, in fact, to build something that goes in production as it is to make a demo like this. Um, <laughs> who'd have thought? Uh, but that, that would definitely be an error for, for or area for further exploration. Streaming would be really great. I didn't implement streaming here uh, just because we're keeping it simple. Um, I'd love to turn this agent into a multi-agent architecture. So this is another best practice and maybe an interesting project where we have like an orchestrator and then we have Haiku handling like more lightweight tasks. You can see this in Claude Code. If you interact with Claude Code, um, right at the end of your session, it'll say tokens used with Haiku, tokens used with Sonnet. Most of the time, Haiku's handling like sort of menial operations to save tokens and to be more efficient. Um, remote code execution is a really cool tool. Uh, it's a cool tool. I've been called a cool tool before. Um, as a matter of fact, I can't tell if it was a compliment or not, but <laughs> remote code execution is another fun, uh, approach. Um, I actually played around with this. I didn't, it didn't make it into the final demo, but you can take that code and instead of running the bash tool, you can just run it in a container on Anthropic servers. So that'd be really cool for like testing code in a sandboxed way. Maybe you have code that you want to test that you don't know, uh, you know, if it's malicious or not or something. I don't know. It could be really fun. Um, something to explore. Reducing latency is important. My agent is not optimized for rapid responses. And I think this is something the Claude Code team does exceptionally well. When you type in a message, like you get a response immediately. And that as a user, for the user experience, that's excellent, right? It makes me feel like something's happening. Um, and, and then as long as I get a response and I get progress, I'm not very concerned, you know, on what's going on. So part of that is streaming, but I think that's another fun area to explore. And really, I think the, the optimization opportunities are endless here. So there's some resources down below. You can find all of this code, including these slides, the notebook in the description. Uh, there are links to all that stuff. And yeah, this is a simple coding agent and a couple hundred lines in one uh, library. Um, but again, I'm Matt. Until next time, peace.